Saturday. Um, Dami mentioned during his announcement that there's something we do called Femi ans asks questions. Yes, it was going to be answers. Um, because we're not, we're not the ones asking the question. If he's asking, like, we don't even need to stream this live. So, um, yeah, so basically any question about Christianity, any question about the sermon, um, any question about City Church, I'll take the easy ones. Uncle Y is here as the wise man to take the um, hard ones. But um, is there anyone in the hall with any question at all? Okay, I think there should be a roving microphone. Yes. All right, with Timmy Dyer at the back. has one. Who else? Is there anyone else? If I in front, I think, is there, is there one posted? Is it semi serious? Yeah, so there's a question online. It says, apparently, it's for you, Uncle Yemi. It says, the Bible says we should watch and pray. It also says we should discern the times. Do these imperatives have anything to do with the number of watches Uncle Yemi wears? <laughs> all maybe, right maybe all there's right. a biblical truth <laughs> yes about. yes very deep very deep yeah there's a question yeah. at the, okay after uh if uh um, oh, is that uh, dale yes all right awesome okay go ahead um okay so my question is how do you help um, someone who has probably loved that has probably lost a loved one like through their grieving process because I feel like it's something that is still kind of new to me. I've had a few people in my life who have kind of lost a loved one within the past year and even more recently another one of my friends just recently lost someone they loved so I really don't know how to like help the process make the process easier like how why you know comfort them with the comfort that christ would want me to basically okay thank you um my question is well on behalf of someone actually um she doesn't seem to reconcile God not being a respecter of persons and Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. How do you um, reconcile them? That's the question. Okay. Yeah. Any other question in the hall? We have, I think who is asked, um, we have one live, um, we have one online, sorry. But is there any other question in the hall? Okay, there's one from Ayobami here, as usual, with these hard, hard questions. Ayobami, there will be a moratorium <laughs> soon. Um, so he says, did Jesus' words fail? In Matthew 24, verses 1 to 35, Jesus speaks of the end of days. But in verses 34 and 35, he says, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That sounds as if all this was supposed to happen in the time of Jesus' disciples. So did Jesus' words pass away without being fulfilled? I know people argue for part of it happening during the destruction of the Jewish temple in AD 70. Can you please clarify? Wow. Um, okay. So how do we... So that's four, those are four questions now. Three Lo questions. Three questions. Yes, Losing a loved questions. one, how to make the process better by a fair. Yes. God not being a respecter of persons, yet showing preference for Jacob and Esau, Utale, and this uh, on uh, Jesus' words failing from Ayobami. Do you have any preference? They're all hard questions. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Um, I think I'll, I can start with um, Ife, and then we'll just sort of progress there. All right. Um, losing a loved one and you're wondering, is there anything you can say or do to make the process uh, better? There, there are many ways to do that. Um, uh, but you always, you, again, you're trying to be grounded in what the scripture says 
uh, or what the scripture helps us to do. So, so first, for you to paint a picture of what life is, um, we are born, we live, and we die. And death is a certainty for everyone. It's a certainty for everyone. But depending on the context, youth, middle age, and all that, you can get a sense of whether this person lived sufficiently enough for people to celebrate and say they lived well, you know. And then there's death. And death is always a part of, uh, of life. And, um, and we always want to think about what, our, what is our eternal destiny when, when, when we die. And that's why we implore, uh, through, you implore through the great, uh, the great Commission asks us and we implore people to embrace the life of Christ, uh, to put their faith in Jesus so that your life here has meaning, but also your exit. Um, so that people can say, I know you, this person is in a better place face to face with the Lord and all that. So when you are when you come to someone who's experienced loss, if it's the person is a believer, if the person's a Christian, um, depending on the whether this is your first meeting with them, meaning you just heard you went sit with them, or you have a chance to to be with them through the process of their of their mourning, you 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 want to continually give both. Christian perspective to help them bear that loss. The perspective on you know where the person is, uh, trust in God. God God is with us even in your sorrow and your mourning. God is not especially angry with you because people think that loss when somebody dies, sin caused it, or the Lord especially hated them. So you have to watch out for all those things that go through people's mind when they've experienced loss. Um, you want to continually give them perspective, but more than anything, you just want to be present with them present with them cry with them um you know you know we we see all the, uh, the portions of scripture that says we do not mourn like people who don't have who uh, like people who don't have hope so you want, want to mourn with hope so even in your mourning you're mourning with your own perspective and you're helping them and sometimes it's a, a sometimes for some people it's reminding them that it's okay to grieve because if a person's a christian too your your christian framework can also prevent you to think oh it's a sign of unbelief or doubting if i so let them mourn, remind them to mourn or mourn with them um, and maybe help out with the things. Because at that moment in time, there's shock, there's a feeling of isolation. So perhaps they need help with some other things in their lives. And that's something you can do for them in one moment or, or over time. So there isn't, just, there isn't one way to help people to grieve. And some losses are cut deeper than others. And some losses take more time be either because of relationship or stage or context. Um, and, and But at all times, you want to also be praying for them and drawing strength from the Lord and drawing comfort from the Lord because the Bible talks about how we comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received from the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5. So there's, there's a number of things you can do. You're praying for them. You're thinking of the person, the, pe the person who was missing, who, who I mean, who, sorry, the person who was lost, the relationships, you're praying for all those things that God will reveal himself to them, comfort them, be with them. You are praying that you yourself would be a conduit of that same comfort. And when opportunity comes, you present um, your own godly philosophy, your own comfort as to, you know, the context of that, where that person is, where God is in all of this, because a lot of things go through people's mind. And so, as God gives you the opportunity to hear from them, hear how they are mourning, you can process and think, oh, perhaps I could help in this way or the other. Do you have any? Would you have any ideas? Um, I think just to um, say that, I mean, just like he said, it's more important in the process of grief to listen more than you actually talk. I feel that a lot of people who... Um, go to meet other people who are helping other people walk through grief. They are more concerned about saying the right things, drawing out the theological, you know, grand things that God is doing. You know, God is sovereign. You know, like, then you start quoting Spurgeon, um, I've learned to kiss the rock that casts me against the rock of ages. It cast, uh, kiss the waves that cast me against the rock of ages. And then you just wax all philosophical and, and deep, but you're actually missing the person. Um, so grief is, grief is, you know, recognizing that there's an actual person who is sorting through different sorts of things at, at the present moment. And so learning to listen more, um, not be like Job's friends. Um, I like to joke that everything was going well in the book of Job until Job's friends started talking. Um, and so learning to actually listen and trusting God's spirit, as he said, to 
how can I say something that's actually going to be helpful um, to the people I'm trying to help? Yeah. yeah, thanks. That's 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 very key. Grief is personal and listen more. All right. Yeah, okay. So um okay, I thought he had gone. OJ asked the question about his friend who says, How do you reconcile God is not a respecter of persons with um Jacob have I loved and Esau I hated? Um, so just for a quick background, it's God that says both things in the Bible. Um, sorry, no, not God says both things, but both things are used to describe God. Um, so God is not a respecter of persons comes from Acts chapter 10, um, verse 34, where Peter, the context is Peter has been, you know, he he was called upon, he had a vision um, earlier on in the chapter to go to meet the Gentiles and, and preach the gospel. But the vision came, the, the vision came, you know, when he had been he had been somewhere fasting and waiting upon God. And then he sees a, a sheet drop from the sky, and there are all sorts of animals within. And then it tells him to rise up, kill, and eat. And he says, No, 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 no. He doesn't. Eventually, um, the, the vision occurs three times, and then just as the, the vision ends, he's told that some people have come and have asked him to come and preach to Cornelius who is a Gentile, who is non-Jewish. And so that's how the gospel ends up there. And so as Peter gets there and he walks there, the first thing he says before he begins to preach in, in verse 34, 34, 35 downwards, is that now I realize that God is not a respecter of persons. What that means is now I realize God does not show partiality. That's what he meant. And then he talked about the good news. Um, Romans chapter 9 talks about God's purpose in election. Um, and it's talking about how God is the one who is sovereignly active in how people become believers. And then he talks about how, in fact, I, I think I should just read it um, in, in the NIV, Romans 9, 11. It says, Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so when you look at both closely, you see that actually there's no, there's no, con there's no contrast. Both of them are passing across the same message. The first one says God is not a respecter of persons in that God does not have there is nothing that commends us to God, that makes us earn God's grace, that makes us become believers apart from God's saving grace. That God looks at all of us and he says, it's not because you are good, it's not because you are fair, it's not because you are pretty, it's not because you are great, it's not because of anything, it's just because I love you. That is how I choose you and call you into my family. And Romans 9 is also making that same point. That before both twins, both children were born, before there was anything good, before... Jacob actually did all the crazy things that he did. God had said, I love Jacob. I'm choosing him. I'm electing him to salvation. And so there's no discrepancy between both. Rather, both of them are commending to us this view that God is the one who actually um, invites us. You know, God is the one who draws us. God is the one who woos us as well. As it were. God is the one who opens our eyes to see the beauty of Christ and the gospel. And that is how we are able to respond. I hope that helps. Okay, and the uh, the third question from Ayobami was on the events of Matthew 24, 1 to 35, um, and all those dark and terrible things uh, that Jesus says will happen. Destruction of the temple, uh, the signs of the times and the end of the age. Uh, uh, um, when he was teaching on Mount Olympus, he says, nobody should deceive you. Deceivers will come. What else was said there? Wars, rumors of wars, uh, all this must come to pass. Uh, there will be no famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, delivery to be killed, abomination of desolation, you know, those who flee to the mountain. And the question is that that even though um, a number of, um, well, well, I think Ibrahim's point is that when Jesus says, this generation will not pass away, that it isn't it likely that the... Um, that the end of the age should have hap should have come at that particular point in time, um, and I would say that you know, you know, I don't know if if the whole you can say the whole passage has to turn on the word this generation because that generation did experience um, all of those things in its 
different uh, context. Even though the temple was torn down, uh, Israel was ground underfoot. Uh, children died. Children died. Families were killed. Um, I don't know. I wasn't present, so I don't know if the moon darkened or the sun. Something happened to it. I wasn't present then. But you would say, you know. So the Bible does this thing where there are prophecies and there are multiple fulfillment of those of those prophecies. Like during the days of Ezekiel, during the days of Daniel, they prophesied many things about the end of the age. And both Daniel and Ezekiel saw a portion of that happen when Babylon was overrun, when the, kings of, uh, the kingdom of Assyria came on them and they experienced that same death and destruction and that same deliverance and salvation for some of them. Uh, and further down in the line of their... Of their and, that, and I remember the one about the abomination of desolation. Um, there's a book that is not... Uh, it's an apocryph apocryphal book called Book of Maccabees that records how um, one of the emperors of Rome um, desecrates the temple and it does this fulfills essentially the pro the prophecy about the abomination of desolation. It happened again in history, but yet we still see in scriptures that that is prophesied that will happen yet again. So we're expecting three abominations of desolations, and I'm not sure that you can say. Jesus' word failed because the end did not come at that time. So when, when uh, if you, if you, this question comes up a lot. Paul, well, if you ask Paul, the Apostle Paul, when was the, when does, when does the end time begin? The end time began as soon as Jesus went into heaven. The end time began as soon as Jesus went into heaven. And Peter had to say, Peter had to, in, in his epistle, had to say, oh, you know, people are actually mocking the faith and mocking Christians, saying, where is this end time you people are talking about? You say the end of the world. You say, you say the end of the world is coming. It's not, it's not happening. You've been saying it for such a long time. And he says, well, it's because, you know, you guys are mocking, but it's because of God's grace and God's mercy that he's drawing out this end of the age period so that many would be saved. So, so I, would say, I would say God's word isn't failing. God's word is being fulfilled. We are experiencing, different generations are experiencing the, the prophecy that prophecy was meant to be fulfilled uh, in multiple times in the, in, the, in the age where Jesus was that led up to the destruction of the temple and, and Israel's life, uh, the life of Israel at that point in time. And it's meant to be fulfilled again uh, at some point before Jesus comes. So I don't think we put, we put on it a, a, an interpretation knowing that there are multiple fulfillments. I don't think you then say because uh, the end did not come in during Jesus' time. Uh, or during the time of maybe the apostle Peter and the disciples, that somehow God's word has failed. I don't know. Yeah, nothing except that it's not every passage of the Bible is not um, equally. You don't you don't interpret every passage of the Bible the same way. Um, and I think there are just a number of interpretive, you know, things that can that. While the answer is yes, the words of Jesus did not fail, but there are a number of ways to see it. First of all is, what exactly is this generation? Is this generation just talking about the disciples who are in front of Jesus? Or is it talking about um, the generation of believers in succession until Christ comes and, you know, the church age is ended? And so I, I do think that, you know, to just look at it and say, oh, you know, the end hasn't come is a very, very simplistic way of looking at things. Um, prophecy, like you were saying, prophecy is often in the Bible, is often layered um, in different, with different implications or different meanings. Um, but I do think the, the point, the larger point for us is when Jesus says to look, to be ready, to be watchful, I think that's ultimately the important thing for us as we, you know, just think about the end. Think about, for instance, the book that we just read, How Will the World End? There are a number of details that we don't know fully how they will play out. But what, what, what we are responsible for is preparing and getting ready, you know, and, and being watchful as the Lord um, prepares to come. And yeah. so if you, and if you, if you pay attention, if, if, if the point of Jesus' words is to help us pay heed, and then you pay heed to all the things he says there, he talks about this same um, desolation of the temple, this occupation of the place of worship by Gentiles, and and you know, and it says this there's this there's this um, conflict that will happen between those who belong to the Lord and by the world until Jesus Jesus comes. And so for us, we still need to continue to pay attention. We still need to continue to 
in being a place of prayer, being a place where Toki asked us uh, and, and, and Dami in the Great Commission to preach the word. The one definitive sign is that that, that when Jesus is going to come, uh, Jesus is about to come, is that the, the message of the gospel will be preached everywhere around the world. And that's what we want, we're trying to do. In order to hasten the coming of Christ, we should preach the word of God. We should preach the gospel so that it, it goes to all the ends of the world. Okay? Any more? Yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. <laughs> now I don't want begging for questions. But if there's no other question, I think we can call it a Sunday. Um, yeah. All right. At home, here. Have a great week. Have a great week, everyone. All Thank right. you. Bye. Bye.